Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Al Hewer. Uh, I am uh, Terry's partner in a and Lectures. I also teach at Rutgers School of Health Professions. I'm an adjunct faculty at the Rush University and County College of Morris Respiratory Care Programs. Um, and I edited several textbooks, including one that relates to the, um, the MBRC credentialing exams. I actually also recently became an item writer for the MBRC. Um, so let's let's take a look. What we did is Terry and I put together these uh, presentations um, that really pertain to questions that you're likely um, to encounter when you take the ACCS exam. They're not uh, verbatim per se, but they are the types of questions that you could expect to see. So to augment the ACCS review, Terry and I have put these presentations together. The uh, what we did was we actually have a total of 75 questions, um, but what we did is we actually separated them into you know questions one through 25, 26 through 50, etc., um, so that you'll actually be able to view these in in um, you know aliquots, if you will, in you know without without doing death by uh, exam uh, exam question review, um, you'll be able to do you know them a little bit at a time and then move on to the to the next part, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's take a, a deeper dive into the actual questions themselves. So question one, an adult patient has an intracranial pressure, ICP, of 24 tor or 24 millimeters of mercury. You conclude that A, the ICP is normal, B, the ICP is below normal, C, the ICP is abnormally high, and D, there is excessive cerebral spinal fluid. Now, before I move on to the correct answer and the, uh, the explanation, you're going to need to know, you know, ICP and ICP means intracranial pressure. You're going to need to know for this exam, CSF stands for cerebral spinal fluid, et cetera. And obviously this question is really aimed at your knowing the, the normal range, if you will, for intracranial pressure. So the correct answer in, in this case is C. Now let's look at the, the rationale for why that's the correct answer. So in supine patients, the mean intracranial pressure normally ranges between seven and 15 tor. In ICP, that's actually greater than 20 tor for more than five to 10 minutes is considered abnormally high uh, in an adult with pressures greater than 25 tor for prolonged periods of time associated with the poor patient outcomes. Excessive cerebral spinal fluid is one cause of ICP, but there's insufficient information to draw that conclusion in this particular case. So what can also happen to, to increase um, intracranial pressure is also brain swelling that you, you would see with things like, um, you know, a patient has a, a trauma, they, they, they have fallen, and maybe they have both the trauma, they have fallen, and now they're, they're, they have a bleed as well. So you can have, you know, a patient that has excessive uh, cerebral spinal fluid, they may also have blood, um, you know, within the, 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 the uh, brain cavity uh, and swelling at, at the same time. Uh, and what that what actually does is it, it can it can actually uh, that the pressure the intracranial pressure can actually squeeze the brain and cause if you will secondary uh, brain injury. Next question. In reviewing a transthoracic ultrasound scan, you note a prominent shadow occurring beneath a rib. What does this shadow signify? A. Pneumothorax. B. Pulmonary edema. C atelectasis, and D, it's a normal finding. So the MBRC is absolutely expecting you to know the, the rudiments of uh, ultra, ultrasound, you know, chest, if you will, chest wall, transthoracic uh, ultrasound. So this is a normal finding, but let's take a look at the explanation and see why is it a normal finding. A shadow beneath the ribs is an expected normal finding when performing a transthoracic ultrasound. The shadow indicating lack of an echo occurs because the sound waves cannot penetrate beyond the rib. This shadow should not be confused with the presence of liquid, which should also appear black, but would be much, much larger. So that would be you know, something like a pleural effusion. Um, and they actually will use ultrasound in order to actually um, you know, drain the, 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 the pleural effusion. They use ultrasound in many cases to actually you know, localize where they actually have to you know, insert the needle in order to drain um, the pleural effusion. Next question, three. Six hours after a confused 
71 year old males admitted to the ED, emergency department or emergency room, with dyspnea, diaphoresis. So, again, you need to know what these terms are that's profuse sweating, hypotension, with lab results indicate elevated, if you will, CK or creatine kinase, and troponin 1. These findings are most consistent with myocardial infarction, neurogenic shock, fluid overload, or pulmonary edema. So one, one of the things that you're going to need to know when you, when, when you uh, uh, sit down for the ACCS exam are some of the, um, the lab values that are not uh, run-of-the-mill necessarily for respiratory therapists. Um, in this particular case, CK, uh, or creatine uh, kinase, um, is in fact associated with a myocardial infarction. Um, the rub with, with this is, or the, you know, the, the, the secondary consideration is these, uh, if you will, cardiac enzymes will uh, take about four to six hours to, to, to be appreciably uh, elevated. Um, so if, the, if, if these labs are done, you know, an hour after the onset of symptoms, they may appear to be relatively normal um, when in fact, you know, the, the patient is, has had a myocardial infarction. More formally, the general feedback is that you know the CK and the troponin one are biomarkers whose concentrations rise when there is damage to the myocardium, the heart muscle. The combination of rise in, in, in uh, the levels of these markers six hours, and again that the range four to six, four to eight hours after in injury indicates an acute myocardial infarction consistent with a patient's clinical signs, specific type of chest pain. So it's not orthopedic chest pain. Um, these markers do not uh, help diagnose neurogenic shock, so the, the other choices as well there. So, you know, in taking, in, in, in answering these questions, one of the things you really look at is, and sometimes you may not know the exact correct answer, but at least try to, um, you know, draw on what you know and what you've learned to eliminate ones that really do not seem to correct. So you can actually take a, a question that you're uh, taking an educated guess on and go from a 25% chance of getting it right um, to taking an educated guess, if you can eliminate two of the answers, um, you're, you're up to a 50% you know, shot. Question four, on assessment of an acutely ill patient, you note all the following in the region of the left lower lobe, decreased expansion, dull note to percussion. So even though we don't percuss a lot as respiratory therapists, the MBRC absolutely expects you to, to know that a dull note is associated with pleural effusion, uh, atelectasis or a uh, consolidation of pneumonia. The absence of breath sounds, tactile fremitus. You can feel vibrations, taking a gloved hand, putting it on the patient's chest. You can actually feel, um, you know, if you will, secretions or vibrations. You also observe a shift, the trachea towards the left, more prominent during inspiration. These findings suggest, so also knowing, you know, when there is uh, a certain types of pathology on one side versus the other, what, what would, uh, the, the, the trachea would shift, for instance, towards, towards atelectasis, uh, uh, towards pneumonia, but it would shift away from things like a pneumothorax. So left lower lobe decreased, et cetera, et cetera. Let's see what the, what the correct answer is here. So a left-sided, you know, obstruction, so, so a mucus plug um, or, you know, or atelectasis. So this is really talking to, you know, a patient has atelectasis on, on the left side, um, but sometimes atelectasis is actually in, in pneumonia are not mutually exclusive. So the patient may not have a full-blown pneumonia, but they, they may well have, you know, mucus plugging, um, an element, if you will, of consolidation. And then downstream from that consolidation is atelectatic lung tissue. Unilateral lung disease in lung expansion combined with a dull percussion note in the absence of breath sounds and tactile firmness signifies either local lobar obstruction with atelectasis or pleural effusion. And again, I'm saying to you emphatically, could also be a consolidation. Uh, in general, the trachea shifts away from large effusions, um, but towards areas of atelectasis and consolidation. Question five. When inspecting the x-ray of an outpatient with uh, nephrotic syndrome, nephrotic syndrome, you note a homogeneous area of increased density that obscures the left costophrenic angle. Which of the following is the most likely problem? Fluid effusion, bacterial pneumonia, pulmon pulmonary edema, or atelectasis? Correct answer is A, left-sided obstruction or atelectasis. 
let's take a gander at, at why that is the correct answer. Pleural effusion is commonly associated with cardiac failure, but can also occur with certain infections, certain types of cancers, renal disease, nephrotic syndrome, and uh, collagen vascular disorders. On x-ray, pleural effusion appears as a uh, homogeneous area of increased density. So it's consistently, if you will, dense. Um, that are position dependent, okay? So if the, if the patient is upright, the fluid will accumulate um, in a blunt or obscure costophrenic angles. If the patient's placed in a dicubitus position, the, the, uh, uh, the effusion will layer out laterally. So if they're laying on their side, the dicubitus position, it will layer out uh, laterally. Question six. You note on inspection of an AP, so an anterior posterior chest radiograph, that the right hemidiaphragm is elevated above normal. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this abnormality? A, right pleural effusion. B, right tension pneumothorax. C, right phrenic nerve paralysis. Remember, the phrenic nerve is emanating from C3 through 5. It's ultimately going down and innervating the diaphragm. And D, right lower lobe pneumonia. Correct answer is C, phrenic nerve paralysis. An elevated hemidiaphragm indicates the phrenic nerve paralysis on the affected side or hepatomegaly, so a large, uh, you know, a large, uh, enlarged liver. Pleural effusions blunt the costophrenic angles, whereas hyperinflation tends to flatten the hemidiaphragms, as does tension pneumothorax on the affected side. Seven. Inspection of a PA, so again, posterior anterior chest radiograph, reveals a CT ratio. Okay. Cardiac to, really, you know, cardiac to total thorax ratio of 60%. Based on this finding, the most, most likely problem is, now, word of caution, rarely are we going to make a, a, a assist with a diagnosis based on one piece of information. Okay. But the MBRC expects if this is the information that you have, then you're gonna you're, you're gonna you know roll with that if you will. A pneumothorax, B fluid effusion, C cardiomegaly, D atelectasis. You think back, the CT ratio, okay, you know that basically the heart silhouette should account for what no more than about fifty percent. So the right answer here is C cardiomegaly. Let's take a look, you know, at why. Normally, the heart width is less than 50% of the width of the thoracic cage. Cardiomegaly exists when cardiac to thoracic width ratio, CT ratio, exceeds 50% in a, a PA chest radiograph. Pneumothorax, pleural effusion, atelectasis can all affect the position of the heart, but not its size, not its size. So things like people get enlarged hearts if they have core pulmonale, uh, people get enlarged hearts if they have uh, mitral valve, uh, it really be so core pulmonal would be mainly the right ventricle. Um, mitral stenosis would be more the left ventricle. But you know people develop it, and you can have both. You know pe pe people uh, can have you know elements of both uh, right and left. You know heart enlargement. Eight normal venous PaO two, okay, um, of forty tor. What is the approximate percent saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen? So this one's really kind of testing a little bit of your math and your memory of, uh, of the formulas that you guys learned when you were in school and maybe you even used to, to today. The correct answer is 73% or C. Let's look at why. The affinity of hemoglobin for O2 varies according to PO2, as described by the S-shaped oxy hemoglobin disassociation curve, the dreaded oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. At a venous PO2 of 40 tor, hemoglobin saturation is about 73%. And again, you can apply the, you know, the 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 rule of thumb. So it's not a, it's not a rule, but a rule of thumb to this question. PO2s of 40, 50, and 60 correspond respectively to saturations of about, about 70, 80, and 90% because the curve at, at this point is steep, at the point, in other words, in the question, a given drop in PO2 causes a large drop in saturation, indicating a weak affinity 
for O2. This decreased affinity for O2 at low PO2 helps release large amounts of oxygen to the tissue and responds to small drops in the, uh, the PO2. Question nine, we'll take a quick look at the graphic and then we'll build on it. You observe the following on bedside capnography display of a patient receiving ventilatory support. What is your interpretation of, of this data? So, you know, crudely put, you can expect, um, you know, three, four questions on um, the capnography and just basically um, capnometry, which is the, the number, but, you know, they're, they're going to expect you to kind of know some of this stuff um, as it applies not just to mechanical ventilation, but also to the indications for non-mechanically ventilated patients, such as those receiving uh, moderate sedation or those uh, afflicted with, um, you know, narcotic overdose and things along those lines. So let's take a look at, the, at, at this one in a little more detail. The, the capnogram indicates uh, expiratory obstruction. Okay, I can, I'll circle back to that. The capnogram indicates rebreathing, okay? The capnogram indicates a leak around the ET tube and D. The capnogram indicates hypoventilation. Think about it. Hypoventilation is going to be, they're going to be retaining CO2, and that wave is going to rise, okay? But it's going to look uniform. The wave, the wave itself is going to look uniform, but it's going to be rising, okay? So, that's, so it's not D. Nor is it B, because those are pretty similar. Rebreathing will also cause a, a, an increase. It's not going to affect this, this notched out shape that you see in the second and third waveform. Okay. The capnogram indicates an expiratory obstruction. What I will tell you is this. Expiratory obstruction will more commonly affect, if you will, the flat portion. It will actually, it, the, the, um, the capnogram will look more like a shark fin. Okay, so this gradual rise, then, um, then this nice flat, you know, top that you have here. But when a capnogram is unable to maintain, if you will, that plateau, it's most commonly associated with a uh, a leak around the ET tube, and that's really what this the general feedback is uh, is explaining here. Question ten. On reviewing ECG or EKG printout, you note a widened QRS complex or complexes. Which of the following is the most likely cause of the problem? Atrial fibrillation, doesn't sound that way. First degree heart block, sinus arrhythmia, bundle block branch. Let's see. Bundle block branch, bundle block branch. The duration of a normal QRS. Funny, I just lectured, lectured on this this morning at Union, Union County College's respiratory program. Is 0 0.12 seconds or less, okay? Causes of a widened QRS complex includes right to left bundle branch block, hyperkalemia, so too high uh, serum K, a uh, ventricular uh, pre-excitation, which is also known as Wolf-Parkinson white pattern, and any ventricular rhythm, including those caused by a ventricular pacemaker, ventricular pacemaker. In performing a patient ventilator check, you note that the expiratory portion of the flow volume loop does not return to baseline. Which of the following is the most likely cause of the problem? This question really speaks to the broader, uh, you know, idea or notion that um, you, you know before you sit down for for the ACCS exam, very good idea to just review your basic waveforms. Not to suggest you don't know them, but it's a it, you know definitely a good idea. Your ventilator scaler scalers are just basically where the the um, the, the horizontal axis is time. Um, or just other forms of waveforms. So decreased compliance, air leak, auto peep, D, over distension. So auto peep is the correct answer. Let's look at why. The presence of auto peep can be visualized on a ventilator graphic display when flow does not return to baseline before the start of the next breath. It actually makes sense. Because the flow did not return to whatever baseline. I say zero, but it, it could be that the patient's on five a peep or eight a peep, whatever the case may be. It doesn't return to baseline. So the patient was still exhaling. And the bottom line was the machine started delivering another breath. Either a flow versus volume loop or a flow versus time scaler will reveal this pattern. Very useful. And you can also obviously do a um, you know, an, an expiratory pause to actually quantify how much that is, et cetera. So it's different tools that are in our toolbox. And then there's, the MBRC is going to expect you to, well, now that you identify that the patient has excessive, 
um, you know, auto peep or intrinsic peep, what do you do? You're going to give them more time for exhalation. So you may want to manipulate the, you know, the eye time or the inspiratory flow to give the breath, the inspiratory portion of the breath quicker so that there's more time um, for, for them to exhale. You know, changing the rate is okay, but you got to watch, it's probably going to change your ABG results as well. Um, but they're going to, again, this question is kind of really should cause you to say, wait a minute, you know, there's, there's other things that I need to be re-reviewing before I, I sit down for the ACCS exam. Question 12, the patient in the ICU is receiving continuous IV drip of uh, opioid analgesic for sedation and pain relief. Which of the following would you recommend for monitoring this patient? I, I alluded to this a little earlier in, the, in this uh, discussion. A, continuous blood pressure monitoring. It's not going to hurt, but intermittent arterial blood gas sampling. Eh, that sounds a little, little, little crazy. And, you know, just pulse oximetry. Yeah, yeah I, like, I like pulse oximetry. Real-time waveform capnography. Real-time waveform capnography, it may be you know, quite obvious, but let's look at the, the, uh, the explanation here. Patients receiving large or continuous doses of opioid analgesics must be carefully monitored for respiratory depression and hypoventilation, ideally with a breath-to-breath -breath method like real-time capnography. Impedance-based apnea monitoring would be satisfactory alternative, um, but it's getting a little bit wonky with, you know, either way you need special equipment. Pulse oximetry is notoriously in, in um, uh, adequate for detecting hypoventilation, especially in patients receiving supplemental O2 and intermittent ABG is just, you know, sticking the patient um, is excessive. What I will also say is pretty much the standard of care today, whether it's, again, a patient who's deliberately getting opioid and analgesics, a patient who's gotten moderate sedation, or a patient who has come in for an opioid, uh, you know, overdose, and uh, they've been given Narcan, but the the, the um, duration of Narcan is going to be, you know, two, three hours, depending on how it's actually given. Um, so when that wears off, the, the opioid is probably going to last longer. So we don't have a standard of care is to have them on capnography. If the patient is totally apneic, okay, the the uh, the capnography is not going to, to detect much end tidal CO2. So while the system is good, it's the standard of care, it's not without its flaws. Patient needs to be breathing and exhaling CO2 in order for these systems to actually work. So just a kind of word of caution um, as well. I don't think the MBRC is going to try to trick you as far as the patient's totally apneic, whatever, but they are, they're going to expect you to know that the standard of care for patients such as this is to use waveform capnography. Question, lucky 13, you're providing BiPAP, 100% oxygen, 55-year-old female admitted to the ED with signs and symptoms of um, acute pulmonary edema. Which of the following laboratory tests would you recommend to help the doctor determine whether or not the patient is suffering from congestive heart failure. Total cholesterol, eh, serum, electrolytes, B, nitric peptide, BNP, also known as blood urea nitrogen, okay? It's actually C, BNP. Here again, NBRC is going to expect you to know some of these discrete lab values that were not you know, we don't graduate from respiratory school being intimately familiar with, but let's take a look. BMP is a cardiac neurohormone secreted by cardiac muscle cells in response to ventricular volume expansion or pressure overload. BMT levels below 100. So, you know, some of these values, when you guys are, are studying these values and you really need to study these values, really kind of know what the normal ranges are and know what the common things that can cause a, you know, high, in this case, a high level. So, um, can help rule out the presence of congestive heart failure uh, or CHF, uh, whereby levels above 500 can help confirm the diagnosis. Blood urea nitrogen is, is uh, you know, uh, obviously for, um, for, for um, you know, a kidney function um, and total cholesterol to assess the risk of heart disease. Um, you know, so again, uh, uh, in and of themselves, not of a great amount of value. And you know, serum electrolytes will not help diagnose a, a, a CHF. Question 14. To change the level of negative uh, pressure delivered by a pleural drainage system, you would adjust the vacuum pressure uh, on the suc suction regulator. B, adjust the water level in the suction chamber. C, adjust the water level in the water seal chamber. D, adjust the size of the atmospheric vent. So again, th this question is really talking about chest tubes, obviously, 
But it's not just this question itself, is you really should you know familiarize yourself or refamiliarize yourself with um, the functioning of, of chest tubes. Let's look at the correct answer. Adjust the water level in the suction control chamber. Remember, that's it's a, the, the wall pressure is not what's controlling it. It's what's in the, uh, if you will, the, the suction control chamber. To change the level of negative pressure delivered by the pleural drainage system, you would adjust the water level in the suction control chamber. Shortly after you replace jet uh, nebulizer tubing on a patient who has a tracheostomy, the saturation drops from 98% to 90%. Aerosols visible throughout the uh, insp inspiratory and expiratory portion in the, tra in the tracheostomy collar. Which of the following should you do first? And BRC is looking for what you would do first to help address the situation. Decrease input uh, flow to the nebulizer, B, Ask the patient to breathe slower and deeper. C, check the entrainment setting on the nebulizer. And D, obtain an arterial blood gas. C, check the entrainment setting on the nebulizer. So again, in general, when the troubleshooting oxygen uh, issues, first step is always to check the O2 source and confirm that, that you know, proper FiO2 is being delivered. Because aerosol is visible throughout the inspiration and expiration, the flow appears to be adequate to meet the patient's need. Thus, you know, to assure a stable FiO2. Given the adequate flow, the only good explanation, <clears throat> pardon me, is that the FiO2 setting, <clears throat> nebulizer was not checked as providing a lower O2 concentration in prior setup. The other thing that it could be, and again, you know, you don't really see this with uh, nebulizers that are on the wall. What you could see this with, though, is another type of entrainment device, which is a Venturi mask, if the entrainment ports become occluded by the bed linen, okay? So I'm not trying to you know, take you down a different rabbit hole, but just, the, you know, basic troubleshooting of air entrainment devices is really something there's something that you actually hopefully do not have to study too hard to do well on this exam unlike you know maybe the discrete laboratory values like bmp you're going to really have to look at more closely blood lactate look at more closely some of your you know act your liver enzymes things along those lines you should look at more closely but some of these other ones hopefully you're just doing a quick review and you can kind of move on to the other things question 16 in assessing a patient receiving volume control ventilation ac uh, you note a decrease in the expiratory volume um, with uh, the high pressure alarm sounding. There's been no change in ventilator settings, which best explains these findings. Increase in the patient triggered respiratory frequency, increase in the airway resistance or decreased compliance, the presence of a leak in the, in the system, malfunction of the uh, ven uh, ventilator volume monitor sensor. So some of these are like distractors, you know, just D sounds like wacky, you know, whatever. But the others you look at, you know, presence of a leak, that would be low pressure, not high pressure, increase in airway resistance or, or a decreased compliance. Certainly that, that is the answer. Um, and an increase in patient triggered respiratory frequency. You know, you, I have a tendency or I had a tendency to kind of read into these questions a little too much. So you're saying, could something, you know, weird happen like the patient's now, you know, asynchronous? And, you know, does A look a little like asynchrony? Yeah, so is it plausible? Yeah. The MBRC wants you folks, wants their exam candidates to pick the best answer. So the best answer in this case is by far B. During volume control ventilation, decrease in expiratory volume occurring together with increased airway pressure, usually indicates increase in total, total impedance. So total impedance is the combination of, of compliance and resistance, as occurs with either an increase in airway resistance or decrease in compliance. Tubing kinking or obstruction or other patient uh, ventilator singer would have a similar effect. Okay, but the best answer is in fact, uh, uh, in fact, B. Question seventeen: A physician asks you to assess upper airway function of a patient with a fenestrated tracheostomy tube. How should this be accomplished? Broader issue is, you know, just review some of your uh, more boutique, um, your your boutique airways, particularly things like you know fenestrated. Um, you know, cuffed versus uncuffed tracheostomy tubes and things along those lines. So A, replace the inner cannula, plug the outer and uh, deflate the cuff or inflate the cuff, excuse me. B, remove the inner cannula, plug the outer, inflate the cuff. Re C, replace the inner cannula, plug the outer, deflate the cuff. And D, remove the inner cannula, plug the outer, deflate the cuff. Let's take a look. D, remove the inner cannula, plug the outer, and deflate the cuff. In the Y, fenestrated tubes, double cannulated tube that is an opening in the posterior wall 
of the outer cannula above the cuff. Removing the inner cannula opens the fenestration. Plugging of the proximal uh, opening of the, uh, the patient's outer cannula to cuff deflate allows the assessment of upper airway function. Removal of the plug allows the assessing for, you know, access for suctioning, et cetera. Just reading those questions, you would probably know the answer. You just got to kind of read the question and the, and the, the available uh, answers, the choices very, very carefully. <laughs> Which of the following represents the proper sequence for the use of air uh, exchange catheter? A tube exchanger, um, they're also called, uh, for changing the patient's ET2. Extubate uh, patient introduced the AEC -A -A into the pharynx, thread it through the AEC, remove the AEC. So that'd be more like a bougie, you know. We would, number one is describing, you know, if you if you have if you've tried everything else and you can't pass such a catheter, etc., you know, but it doesn't describe a, a, a tube exchanger. B. Insert the AAC inside the old ET tube, remove the old T, uh, the old tube, thread the, the new one over it, and you know, then remove the AEC. C, insert the AEC next to the old endotracheal tube, remove the old tube, thread the new tube over, remove the AEC. Extubate the patient. We're right there. It's just uh, that sounds hokey to start with. So let's see what let's see where correct answer is B. Let's look at why a tube exchanger is designed to allow the exchange for ET2 for another without losing airway access. Were you to extubate the patient before the exchange options, you know, you might lose airway access. And the only way to ensure AC is properly positioned is to make the exchange first and, you know, in, inside the old properly, um, the old ET tube and then thread it over there. Whenever you use one of these uh, devices, just be careful because you're um, you need to be prepared to reintubate. Because sometimes just you know taking the old tube out it dislodges the, the the tube exchanger. So you just need to have an intubation box and skilled personnel nearby. Question nineteen: Which of the following associated with difficult intubation by direct um, laryngoscopy? So large tongue, small oral pharynx, small neck circumference. Small tongue, large oral pharynx, large mouth opening. So C and D just don't really seem to make sense, but let's take a closer look. Large tongue, small, you know, oral, uh, oral pharynx, or, you know, if you will, mouth opening. The, the patient opens the mouth and they're, they're um, difficult to visualize. Um, so the lemon mnemonic, it's one of them that you could use can help, uh, you know, try to predict a difficult intubation. When you have that option, if it's a code blue, you know, you just, you do the best you can, but sometimes it's an elective intubation, you can actually assess the patient. LEMON stands for look externally, evaluate external anatomy, uh, malin patty classification, obesity, obstruction, and neck, neck mobility, neck mobility. The patient cannot fully cooperate, oral inspection needed to assign a malin patty, one should at least attempt to assess size of the tongue relative to the oropharynx. A little bit of preparation in advance is a good thing. Question 20, hospitalized patient with a laryngectomy and a tracheal esophageal voice prosthesis who is being treated for pneumonia requires tracheal bronchial suctioning. To suction this patient, you would do what? A, insert the, the catheter via uh, the nasal tracheal route. B, insert the, insert the catheter via the stoma. C, insert the catheter through the voice prosthesis, and D, insert the catheter via the, via the oral route. Remember, patients have a total laryngectomy. What? They do not have an opening between the mouth, in the nose and the mouth, and the lower airway. So you're going to insert directly into the stoma because that will give you access to the lower airway. Patients with laryngectomy, there's no connection between the stoma and the upper airway. For this reason, they, they need to be um, suctioned in the way that is described. Question 21, you're called to the ER to help in the assessment and care of a patient admitted with CHF in severe pulmonary edema. While starting an intravenous line, the patient tells you to give the patient O2. You would state, um, if you will, start the following. Non-rebreather A, B, nasal cannula four liters, C, simple mask at five liters, which give you around 40%, give or take, air entrainment, uh, at 35%, at 35%, okay. 
So this particular patient thinking in advance here, you probably want to give them a lot of oxygen. So non-rebreather mask would probably be the way to go. And, you know, clearly um, you're thinking in terms of, uh, you know, non-invasive positive pressure and things along those lines, but that's going to take, you know, a while. I mean, at the hospital I work at, we actually ran out and we had to rent them. So it wasn't like, you know, you're going to get one in, in two minutes type of deal. It was going to be longer than that. So just to buy yourself time, um, you know, A, give them the high, you know, high FIO2. Patient CHF, pulmonary edema, typically have a severe hypoxemia, um, compromised myocardial function. In these cases, you want to provide the highest uh, oxygen that you can. Uh, again, just uh, skipping ahead here, you might also recommend CPAP or BiPAP with 100% oxygen for this patient since the elevated airway pressure can help reduce venous return, alleviate pulmonary uh, congestion, and theoretically help push some of that fluid uh, back in, the, in, you know, out of the lungs and back into the vascular space. Another one of those questions with a graphic here, question 22, you observe the following graphic display on a patient receiving volume controlled AC ventilation. The most significant problem is, let's take a look, A, leak in the uh, patient ventilator system, inadequate flow, improper sensitivity, presence of auto-peep air trapping, auto-peep air trapping. Let's take a look. Inadequate inspiratory flow. Let's look at why. The primary problem apparent in this graphic is the scalloping, scalloping of inspiratory airway pressure waveform occurring after the beginning of inspiration. Normally, pressure should rise after inspiration begins. A drop in pressure, scalloping as we said, during the flow-limited volume control ventilation indicates inadequate inspiratory flow. The upper expiratory flow wave, wave pattern, pattern also suggests slight auto-peep. So again, scalars, graphics, just I, my advice is re-review them before you sit for the exam. Question 23, physician orders 70-30 Heliox to be delivered to patient acute asthmatic attack. So status asthmaticus, which of the following systems would be most appropriate for this patient? Bear in mind, it doesn't say anything about the patient being intubated, whatever. Nebulizer, 100% um, oxygen with aerosol mask. B, tight-fitting non-rebreather mask with a competent valving. Remember, it's a thin gas, right? So competent valving, so you're losing as little as as as, uh, as possible. C, simple oxygen mask set to deliver 15 liters per minute and the tight-fitting partial rebreathing mask set at 12 liters per minute. Tight-fitting non-rebreather is the right answer, and this just elaborates on, because a tight-fitting non-rebreather mask, competent valving, set the appropriate, can deliver close to 100% of the gas source, okay? It approximate characteristics of a fixed performance delivery system. For this reason, the, the well-designed non breather is the system of choice for short-term you know, administration of high concentrations of, in this case, Heliox. Question 24, home stretching it. When 15 sonometers of PEEP is initiated, a patient's cardiac output drops from 5 to 2.53. Uh, so it's really cut in half. Dramatic drop. It's not like it went from five to, you know, 4.8. Um, and the systemic blood pressure drops from 115 over 70, so that's, that's adequate, to 85 over 55. P.S. So when the MBRC and clinically, when that systolic starts dropping below 90-ish, um, that's a grave sign. So this is a significant drop in cardiac output, a significant drop in systemic blood pressure. Which of the following actions would be appropriate? Maintain um, the present settings and check an ABG in an hour, decrease the respiratory rate to extend cardiac filling time, uh, increase PEEP, increase PEEP slightly to reach the optimal PEEP, decrease the PEEP back to 10, recheck cardiac output, and obviously recheck a lot of things, you know, their saturation, maybe a blood gas, et cetera. So the correct answer is in fact D. One of the most common problems with PEEP is that can, it, it can adversely affect cardiac output, um, systemic blood pressure. In this case, uh, the, a fall in cardiac output is potentially life-threatening. You, you know, it indeed is. It's been cut in half and, and perfusing pressures have been cut dramatically as well. PEEP level must be decreased and the patient's cardiac output, um, you know, remeasured. Question 25, the last of this batch, of this batch. Um, a patient is admitted to the emergency department or ER um, with severe upper airway trauma. Attempts to intubate the patient fail. You cannot ventilate this patient using a bag valve mask uh, um, resuscitator. Which of the following actions are recommended this time? This is a grave situation because you, you, you don't have an airway. Surgical uh, cricoid thyrotomy, 
a nasal uh, a tube insertion, laryngeal mask airway insertion, esophageal tracheal tube insertion. Surgical crike, surgical crike. So they're in the emergency room. That's really the key. They're not in the field. They're not on the street. They're already in the emergency department. Um, let's again, look at this. So it, it makes sense, but let's look at the explanation. Superglottic airways, LMAs, combi tubes, king tubes are contraindicated in the presence of upper airway trauma. And if the patient can't, be intubated via direct uh, laryngoscopy, blind nasotracheal intubation is not a viable option. When the traumatic upper airway injury results, can't ventilate, can't intubate situation, badness. It's just also known as badness. Emergency surgical access to the trachea is indicated. This can be accomplished either by a crike or by a, a percutaneous uh, tracheostomy. So that concludes our first batch. Let me just share this with you. So these are some potentially helpful resources I included um, a textbook that I co-edit, um, the Comprehensive Respiratory Therapy Exam Preparation Guide. It's really geared, you know, that text is really geared much more towards the TMC exam, but do understand that there's a strong overlap between the TMC exam, you know, the, the, the ICU, like the adult ICU questions of, of, of the TMC exam and what appears on the ACCS. I put Egan's in there as well, which I which I uh, co-edit, but I'm, I'm not proud. And I say Kettering is uh, expensive, but they're an outstanding source. Lindsay Jones, outstanding source. Uh, and let's not forget the National Board for Respiratory Care that actually has um, sample questions. They have a lot of a lot of really good resources, including the exam matrix, which you all absolutely need to take a take a close look at. You know, tape it to your refrigerator, et cetera, and identify those areas where you're going to have to spend more time reviewing than others that maybe you, you can go a little lighter on. I want to thank you guys very much. Again, we have the other two presentations that'll cover questions 26 to 50, and then, you know, from 50 up as well. So thanks a lot. Have a great day. And hopefully you got something out of this presentation.